Hey everybody, Michael Davis here and welcome to Bone to Pick. Uh, I am so excited to have our guest uh, with us today. We've been talking about doing this interview for years, it feels like. Uh, pandemic aside, uh, we've wanted to get this gentleman on the show and we've finally done it. Uh, today is the day. Um, he has been described by critics as one of the best all-around tuba players in the history of the instrument. And we're talking about the great Marcus Rojas. Uh, Marcus has performed and recorded with a myriad of artists, to say the least. Uh, the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, New York City Ballet, American Symphony, Joffrey Ballet, Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, Yo-Yo Ma, Lester Bowie's Brass Fantasy, Michael Jackson, uh, Art Ensemble of Chicago, uh, Jazz and Lincoln Center with Wynton Marsalis, and has uh, played with a variety of ensembles led by Gil Evans, uh, George Russell, Jim Hall, Dave Douglas, Wayne Shorter, uh, the list goes on for quite a while. Uh, it's fun, like seeing the diversity of these artists that uh, he he has performed with. Amazing. Uh, he's toured with, among others, Paul Simon, Sting, and David Byrne. Uh, has over 60 motion picture soundtrack credits. Uh, he has played on countless jingles, dozens of Broadway shows. Um, and perhaps one of the most important things, he's an avid proponent of uh, contemporary classical and improvised music uh, that he has performed and he's had commissions written for him. Uh, I'm really looking forward to talking about that with him. Um, he's also on the faculty at the Berkeley College of Music and Boston Conservatory. Uh, he's a proud native of Brooklyn, New York, where he continues to reside. Um, he's a graduate of the New England Conservatory in Boston. And I have to say on a personal level, uh, he and I have been friends for decades and colleagues. And um, I'm super excited that uh, he's here today. And I'm always excited when we get a chance to work together. He uh, played uh, all the tuba work on our recent brass quintet CD called Five. Just sounds amazing on that. He also... Uh, did a lot of work on the Brass Nation, the original Brass Nation record, as well as the 20th, 20th anniversary uh, special edition CD that we put out last year. So, without further ado, Marcus, thank you so much for coming to New City today. So good to be here. This is incredible. It's happening. We're doing it. Yay! Finally! <laughs> We've been there. Every time we'd see each other in a session, yeah, we got to schedule that. So, uh, it, it, it really does feel like that. So, that's it's great. Um Let's. It was so fun to see uh, and read about your uh, amazing career and the in your life and music uh, uh, in preparation for this interview. But let's talk about your early years growing up in Brooklyn. I know you were around music like crazy. I I love seeing that you had so much Latin music influencing you. Totally. Um, and how you got started and just what those early memories are for you. Sure. Well, I was born in in Redwood Projects, and my mom too, like a single mom. She was barely eighteen years old. I never met my dad. I mean, I just met him a couple times, you know, like when I was really little, you know. Mm. Uh, so I basically was raised by my mother and her eight brothers and sisters. And so, and she was one of the oldest ones. So basically, I was like the ninth kid. Oh, my gosh. No. And they were listening to everything from James Brown to like Tito Rodriguez, like the old Latin stuff. And then the newer stuff, Fania All-Stars. And... Um, uh, I mean, every kind of dance music there was. I mean, basically, we came from, I come from a real dancing family, mm. you know, a Puerto Rican family. That's my mom's side. And uh, so we would just dance to music all the time. Like, there, there wasn't an event that happened. Even when house cleaning came on, it was like, <laughs> okay, put on your rags and start cleaning the house. And then put on music and do a soul train line. Yeah. And just, you know, it was really like the, the whole thing was about that. And then two of my uncles played music. And my grandfather was actually a composer. He was a cab driver hmm. uh, in New York City for over 35 years. But he also played guitar and it taught himself. He only went to the third grade, but taught himself how to write music and i have this music as like a suitcase of his music and the stems are backwards and stuff and it's kind of funny but he was taught himself to write these <laughs> songs and he'd get other people and the story is that he was in two big car accidents mm. that were bad for him and he had hurt his back and after the first one he told my grandma all right so once we do the settlement uh we're going to get a house. We'll get a house in Park Slope. Now, Park Slope wasn't what Park Slope is now, but still, <laughs> they had a nice house in Park Slope. And he took the money and recorded his music instead. Oh. And she's like, what? <laughs> Second accident, same thing. He says, okay, no, no, really, we're going to get a house. We'll get a house, you know. 
he goes and hangs out with his friends and they they cut these records. So when he died, it is right. She just threw them out. They meant nothing to her. She was like, Are you can they, they meant the house that she should be her had. house. Yeah, right. <laughs> so so he was an you know, amateur musician and the songs are cool. I actually have about like five of them and they're done on those like wax, mm. you know, like you know, pressed, you know, like individual ones. They weren't multi, you know, they weren't in production or anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, and then, so one of my uncles was a, a trombone player, actually, mm. uh, my uncle Willie. And then his little uh, older brother, by like you know, eleven months or something, was an incredible conguero mm. percussionist. I mean, really, really deep musician. And I didn't realize it then until years later. I'd play with all these musicians. Like, how come you're not as good as my uncle Benny? You know, because <laughs> I didn't realize he was incredible. He was really like super deep. And we would go in New York City. So they have these like. You go to any park, Prospect Park, Central Park, and the guys like drumming kind of things. And he was kind of a shy guy, and he's just kind of, hey, man, can I, you know, can I get in some drums? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, sure. And he'd just start playing, and he would immediately go into like a trance. He was just like, and he would just be playing a part. It's not like soloing, just boom, dink, dink, do, 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 dink. And the guys would just look at him. And I remember being just little, like, that's how, that's how you play drums, like, you know. Yeah. And then the guy would like hand him another drum. And so he'd now have the quinto, which is a small one, and another tumba, you know. And he's playing now two parts, and I gave him another drum. And he's not even playing solos. He's just, like, grooving so deeply mm, mm-hmm. that it was, like, it was hypnotic for everyone around him. It was kind of deep. Wow. So that's, like, one of like my early memories is, like, someone throwing down music that hard. But it was, like, well, that, that's how you play, right? That's, like, the way you're supposed to play. I mean, because he was also kind of my goofy, weird uncle, you know. It wasn't weird, but, you know. Anyway, um, so both of those guys passed away tragically, and uh, and then um, yeah, so my mom the, the amazing thing is my mom had the foresight to leave that that neighborhood and move to Bensonhurst, which is a whole other neighborhood in Brooklyn, mm-hmm. a Italian American neighborhood, and the schools were infinitely better, and that's when uh, Mrs. Levine put a tube in my hand when I was in the third grade. And, wow. and I was a chronic asthmatic, so I showed up to school like a, a week after everyone had been there. And she gets me in front of the class and goes, this is Mark Rojas. And uh, we're going to let him play the tuba. And the kid's like, yay! I'm like, what the, what's the tuba? What is the tuba? And I'm like, look at that shiny horn. It's cool. Like way better than that, like, that black thing, the, the clarinet, you know, like whatever. So that, and, and I've been playing the tuba ever since. And wow. uh, and she also had like a xylophone choir, and she had her system that she taught us. So I knew like you know what, what f- eight notes, not even. I knew five notes on 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 the tuba in at elementary school. Then I went to junior high school, and that's when it got more, started getting more serious. Another really good music teacher named uh, Ron Schaefer, who also had a, a performing arts camp called French Woods, and he saw something in me, and he. When I was in junior high school, I wanted to play tuba the tuba with the band, <laughs> nice. and he had a he had a, a what did they call them? A, a stage band? Yeah, yeah, stage, stage band, band, you know. band, of course. And so he had a stage band. I remember we played like da 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 da, like the stripper song da da da. Yeah. Uh, and it was like woo because it was on commercials. Anyway, so th- those I'm telling you, I think you, all of us who play music can always point back to like, yeah. a teacher who's like that's the one who launched me. And I have to say it was those two teachers that really set me on a path to, to start playing music. And, and, and then he's a guy, I have a good story about him. Am I talking too much already? No. no. Okay. okay. <laughs> so this guy, when I was in, when I was in a junior high school, he said, hey, I want you to audition for, for, for the high school music and art. And I was mm-hmm. like, what's that? I was like a real Brooklyn, like, mm. real, like, mm-hmm. rough kid. I was like, what the hell is that? He's like, watch your mouth, you know, I'm like, and he was like old school Jewish, you know, like Brooklyn guy too, you know. And so he goes, it's an arts high school, I want you to audition. He goes, and he, and he got me an application, he goes, hey, I signed, have your mother sign this, bring it back tomorrow, right? So he was hounded me, he's like, come on, where's the application? And finally, the application comes in, okay, so you, gotta, you have an audition now, and you, you have to go do this audition. I said, okay, great. So he'd ask me, are you practicing? I was like, yeah, I'd like to play. And I never went to lunch. I didn't do shop. I would hang out in the music room instead of the band room, right? So I'd be in there practicing. And one Monday he comes in uh, and he says, so how was your audition? <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> You son of a... And he's like pissed. And I was like, I had my friend. I said, Mr. Schaaf, I don't want to go to no fag school. Yeah. That's the kind of kid I was. Like, you know, and wow. he was like, what? And he grabbed me by my hair, literally grabbed me by my hair and brought me up to the guidance council, put me in a chair, calls up the school. I have this kid. He's very... Te- and, and he needs to... He, he missed the audition. Uh, you need to hear him. Oh, oh, great. He'll be there. There was another weekend of auditions. Wow. 
Saturday morning, so this that was like Monday, Saturday morning, there's, there's a bell, my do doorbell rings and wakes us up, you know. And I hear my mom at the door say, Mr. Schaefer, what are you doing here? He came to get me. Mm. He came to my house. He walked in my room. He took pants. And was, hey, put those on. Come on, get us. Hurry up. I'm going to get you some breakfast. I'm like, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? Got your audition today. I was like, oh. So he literally came. Got, we got breakfast. He drove me up to 135th Street, which is far in, in Harlem. And I did my audition. And that's how I got into music and art. Wow. If it weren't for that, I'd be working in the pizzeria right now. <laughs> <laughs> it is amazing how, you know, it's, it's teachers that early on. It shows how important they are in our lives, but they've changed the trajectory of your, of your life. You know? I say and, that uh, all the time. Getting into music and art was uh, monumental. And it also, I love hearing the stories about your uncle. Now it explains how you have such a great groove in the way you put playing the tuba. It kind of makes, uh, yeah, makes a lot more sense because it's not something you would normally hear from a tuba player is, is that kind of thing. Well, it, speaking of important teachers, I know this next gentleman uh, is very near and dear to your heart, but uh, tell us about your, your early lessons and, and the relationship with Sam Palafian. Oh, man. He was my teacher when I was 15. So I, I was at Music and Art, and there was another guy there. I always say my brother from another mother, a guy named John Sass. I don't know if you know him, incredible tool player. Mm. And he's, uh, he was, when I was a freshman, he was already, he was a junior and he was already six foot seven <laughs> and he was this huge guy and he'd hear me like playing and he's like, you sound pretty good. You know, you should take some lessons, you know? And I was like, yeah, okay, whatever, you know? And then he says, no, you should take lessons. Like well, with who? How am I going to take lessons? And he says, well, my teacher, Fan Palafian. And so he wrote it down. And I never did anything about it until I, I won this little, I did a little solo thing and I got, I won like 500 bucks to take lessons. And so, so um, that's when I started taking lessons mm. with Sam. I called him, I got the nerve to call him. And I also um, wound up, um, you know, just meeting, I, I met him at, a, he used to teach out of the Charles Cohen Studios, mm -hmm. which is a legendary place. Which I wound up having a studio there too with Bruce Bombasudo and Jack Gale. Sure. And um, 52nd Street, right? Was it was on 53rd Street. 53rd. Oh, 53rd, right, right, right. right, right, right. Yeah. And they had the, they had the studios and they had the apartments across the street and in the basement. So um, I remember going to my first lesson and and he's not there. It's, it's like half an hour, no one there, and uh, I'm just kind of waiting outside. Like, oh, where's this guy? I, don't know, I guess I was about to leave, and some guy runs up to me. He's like. Hey man, how's it going? He was wearing like purple sweatpants and like you know, and he's like kind of hip, hip looking dude. I'm like, yeah, who are you? He's like, sorry, man, just going for a run. Anyway, you ready to play? I'm like, sure. Who are you? What? You're my tuba. I was thinking I was going to see some other kind of guy. You know? Yeah. And uh, and so I started lessons with him, and and um, and I was probably the last high school student he had before he moved to Boston because he from the, the Empire Brass had just won Nomburg. Hmm. And he was still living in New York. And so that year he left. So after I studied with him for a year, he split to Boston. And that's when I started uh, taking lessons with a guy named Steve Johns, who was mm -hmm. a very, very mm -hmm. important teacher to me. Uh, he taught at, um, at Manhattan School of Music in the prep department. And uh, he figured very importantly in my life, other than mm. he helped me get into colleges. And uh, But Sam was an interesting guy because everything about Sam didn't smell of old-fashioned tuba. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, who's this guy? He talked like a hip guy, you know. He was always like, you know, messing with you, talking street stuff. And he used to call me Brooklyn. Yo, Brooklyn, you know. <laughs> and uh, and I had a kind of a mouth on me. And he was like, yo, 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 you can't say that shit. I was like, oh, well, how about you? You know. <laughs> so, um, but, and he, and you know, he played with Pink Floyd. He did all these cool things, you know. And, he, you know, he had a vibe about him that was really special and then i remember when i went to see him play i was like wow you don't play like other tuba players like that's some other thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and even then he was playing trad gigs and playing jazz kinds of stuff and uh, and we stayed close so when i went to new england conservatory to study with yet another member of the new york tuba quartet which was tony price which we didn't mention and steve johns and sam was toby hanks and toby mm -hmm. was my teacher in college mm. um and so um while I was studying with Toby, I'd go to BU to hang out. And Sam would, like, give me lessons. As a matter of fact, when I went to BU, when I went to NEC, I didn't own a tuba because I only played a school tuba. And so I was trying to get a tuba, and I was playing a King 
bell front tuba at school <laughs> and uh it was incredible tuba i wish i had that tuba now but it was very not hip yeah know? yeah so he said hey hey brooklyn i got this i got this horn for you i was like he goes it's it's arthur fiedler's barber's tuba i'm like what he goes yeah it's nunzio or something it was like his barber would take with him you know, on tour sometimes you know for like run outs and stuff and he passed away and he goes and he had this Beautiful mirror phone, one of these six. He goes, it's a good price, man. I said, I don't have the money. He goes, I'll buy it for you. And he paid me back. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, so Sam was super, super important. That's very cool. What was the, the overall experience? I know you went to New England Conservatory, so you studying with those guys. Right, right. So, I was, so NEC like was a cool place, too, because... So the reason how I got in there is a funny story, too. I got them full of stories. But because uh, when I auditioned, I auditioned for Juilliard and Manhattan School of Music and, you know, in a, in a couple of local schools. And I got into those schools, but I got a full scholarship to go to Manhattan School of Music. And, and Toby Hanks was there. And so I thought, great. And I get a call from Toby, and he says, hey, do you want to go to NEC? I was like, Where, what's that? He mm. said, what's well, a really good music school in Boston? And I said, well, I'm already, I got a full scholarship. He goes, no, I know you got a full scholarship. You got it because <laughs> I recommended it. He said, but, you know, you could come here. You know, you could go to Boston. And I was like, well, I don't really have any money. I, we, we were pretty poor. My, my, we were a welfare family and that kind of stuff, you know. So, um, so he said, well, I don't, he goes, well, if you go here, he goes, you know, the cool thing about going there is that I have, I have a bunch of guys in Manhattan school. But at here, I only have a couple of guys. You probably get a lot more touches. You get mm. to play more. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, that sounds cool. So then I, I said, what do I have to do? He goes, you have to, well, you have to apply. <laughs> so I applied, you know. And I remember I was hanging out with my friend. We were playing ball. I was like, uh, I got to fill this out. I was like, financial aid application. I was like, watch this. Check this out. Zero, 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 zero. Like contributions. <laughs> like we had no money. It was like, the, uh, I did it as like a goof. Zero, 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 zero. Like a dancing around. La, la, la. And I got in because he recommended me. But then he also gave me a stipend to live. Mm. And I was like. Oh, that's cool. I don't, because if I went to Manhattan School of Music, I would have had to live at home. So it's like, oh man, I don't have to live at home and I could go to school in Boston. Oh man. Okay, cool. So yeah. that's what I did. And I thought, I'm just going to go to school for Boston, be the greatest food player in the world, and leave school forever. Like, I was such an idiot, you know? <laughs> so I'm still an idiot, actually. <laughs> but uh, so that's what I did. I, I wound up going there and I stayed. And it was a really amazing place because, you know, Gunther Schuller had been the president there. So they had, it was the place that had the first accredited jazz program. Mm -hmm. But they also had this thing called the Third Stream Department. Right. Which is this kind of thing where it mixed, it was a classical music meets jazz, meets world music. And it was just, People playing music, it didn't have to be jazz or not jazz, which yet another thing that set me up to be mm -hmm. a certain, like, made me realize, oh, wait a minute. So I was playing little folk trios, you know, and I was playing in, in I, George Russell, that's how I met George Russell as mm. a student, mm. and then I used to play with him later. Uh, and Jimmy Jufri was there. He was oh, teaching. Right, and right, I played. Right. And you know, I didn't even know who he was. This is the classic thing of being a kid. You're like, oh, you're Jimmy Jufri. And he was doing his like, like the Jimmy Jufri trio stuff. And I was like, man, this is boring, man. I want to play like Marcus Miller, man. I want to play funk <laughs> on the tuba, man. Boop, 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 boop. You know? And he was like doing these little tunes, and I didn't take advantage of it. You know, like, honestly, be, to be honest. And Jackie Byard was there. There's mm -hmm. all these amazingly, but they all were creative and bubbling. And, and so, I got to play in the medium rare jazz band, which was the, the top jazz band because they were doing, you know, s some Gill stuff. That was the mm -hmm. first time I ever played any Gill music. So it was a place where I got to do a lot and they had an incredible chamber music program. So I had already had, you know, my teachers with well, Toby and Sam were chamber music guys. And at this school, they had a thing called the Scholarship Brass Ensemble. Well, actually, all of it had a woodwind ensemble, brass ensemble, uh, Piano trio, string quartet, you know, and you could audition and jazz ensemble, and you could audition with a group, and if you won, then you you got to do a recital at Jordan Hall, but then mm. you also did all the ser you did like ten services for the school, and you got paid to do them, right? And then you got first dibs on all the gigs that came to the gig office. So wow. I was in this group for two years, and then we also got to play like the Etler. John Swallow was the was the coach. I, at one point, I was in three brass quintets at the same time when I was at NEC. I was mm. so into that kind of mm. music because mm -hmm. it felt like, wow, I can actually dig in and like be a part of the, the outcome yeah. as opposed to having someone tell you what it was. And, and so I, it really set something up in me. that And, and then also, so I was watching Sam. Empire was really blowing up at that mm -hmm. point. And so I wanted to play like him. I wanted to play like Toby. I loved Harvey Phillips, you know, because these are all guys who 
who who took chamber music very seriously, and mm-hmm. that was a big thing. And it, and, and with that came new music, mm-hmm. you know. And sometimes there are all these pieces that no one wants to listen to, but are really fun to play. <laughs> <laughs> but still, I loved it because, like, man, I get to dig it. It was almost like problem solving, and then and. I was good at it. Mm-hmm. I was really good at it. And that thing about grooving, I always had this thing, like, I have to find the groove in the music. Like, so if it was like, I was like, I was and, like immediately turning into that. Mm. And the teacher was like, yeah, man, that sounds really cool. That piece <laughs> sounds really hip that way. I was like, okay. Because that's the only way I can make sense of it. I could just count it. It didn't make sense if I just counted it. But I could find the feel of it. You know, no matter how weird it was, I would find, oh, there it is, the pattern, there's the pattern. Oh, oh now the bugs are mm-hmm. bumping the pattern. So, like, odd meters became, like, oh, this fun thing. You know, when I f- discovered, like, fives and nines, I was like, this is amazing. You know, doom, doom, tick, doom, 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 tick, doom, whoa. <laughs> you know, groove music. And they're like, no, it's not. It's contemporary music. It was like, groove music to me. Yeah. So it was funny. Like, I was all of a sudden, all these things were crashing together in a really cool way. But it was only because that's the only way I can make sense of it. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it sounds like a, uh, just an amazing uh, juxtaposition of all these events and teachers and ensembles. And just like that's what you hope for anybody going to a music conservatory is, is to be uh, energized about music and, and new music and, and, and all of that. That's, that's uh, very cool to hear that sto- those stories. Um, let's talk a little bit about, then you moved back to New York after yep. Boston. T- yep, yep. Talk I, about, I, I, uh, the day I graduated, I left. And what I, I kind of hated Boston, honestly. Really? Oh, okay. Because it was like a small town compared to New York City. I mean, New York City was like a crazy. Sure. I mean, I remember the first time I, I went, I, I'm not a drinking guy or anything. I'm not like a boozer, but I remember I was practicing until 12 o'clock every night when I first got to school and I went to get a beer, you know, it's just take one beer. I went to get a beer and the guy goes, uh, you can I'm like what he goes i need to see your cat i'm like what cat are you talking about it's like id come on id i was like i'm 18 what are you talking about i'm 18 he goes put it back i'm like what do you mean i'm 18 he's like yeah 21 what are you from new york get out of here and i'm like it's just a freaking beer and i'm like arguing with the guy that's of course like a uh, like a, 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 a football player from uh whatever the school is nearby you know she comes up <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what are you gonna hit me? Cause I want a beer. Like, it's like get out of here. But I couldn't stand it, and I was like, it's you know. But I, I got a lot of practicing done. Yeah. And so I just didn't do anything social. All I did was practice, and I didn't hang out. You know. What was once you got back to New York? What was, you know, I, I've known you so long, but I, I can't really picture like those early, early years for you once you got back. But what was that like? And and. You know, how, how long did it take you to get to, I mean, I, I think of you as the top call freelance guy in New York for, for decades now, but uh, what, what's your memories on some of those, uh, those early years back, back in New York? So it was 1985, and again, I'm the luckiest person. Like, when you were just describing, talking about me just now, I was like, yeah, I've always been the most blessed person I know. So <laughs> when I come back to New York, you know, I'm coming home. First of all, it's home. So that's the one good thing. And I wasn't a student to other people. Some of my friends who stayed here, let's say who went to Manhattan School, went to Juilliard, hated New York. They're like, I gotta get out of here, you know. Mm-hmm. And they were oh, they, their their teachers were in town, and they they were always looked at as students. I came as like this like fresh faced like, yo, what's up? I'm in New York. I can't. <laughs> this is a kiss on the ground, the dirty side. Welcome back here. But also, my teachers were here. So even though I went to school in Boston, and and, and Toby was teaching there, he was the principal too of New York City Ballet. Mm, mm-hmm. So by Nutcracker time, he called me to do his stuff. He goes, hey, Marcus, you ever do a, a Nutcracker? And I said, no. He goes, eh, it's okay. It's easy. And so I, do, I go walk in and do my first Nutcracker. And the contractor's <laughs> like, who are you? I said, no, well, Toby. He goes, Toby sent you? He goes, son of a bitch. <laughs> and he goes, you've played Nutcracker before, though, right? I was like, no. Oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> this is a guy who never swore. but yeah. So anyway, so he hooked me in to, to doing stuff. My teacher, Steve Johns, who's my teacher, was at New York City Opera and doing tons of other gigs. So they were throwing me stuff. Like mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. I remember playing Studio 54. Actually, it was the, the semester before I came home for New Year's Eve. And he got a hipper gig to play with the Philharmonic on New Year's Eve. So I went and I'm like, New Year's Eve at Studio 54 in <laughs> 1980, like when, when it's turning 1985? Wow. Yeah. Like some serious, you get your free gun in a place like that. Right? So I was like, this is the greatest of all time. I love being a musician. 
But I also worked at a brokerage firm, you know, like just as a, you know, like just inputting data, you know, data, and uh, I worked as a waiter. You know, I did plenty of like that kind of stuff because it wasn't like they plugged me in totally, you know. Uh, but then the big, the big thing for me was that I, I found this group of musicians. Um, well, there's, there's guys in, in, in Boston, a guy named Frank London, who actually was living in New York, who was a great trumpet player. Uh, and he, he runs a group called Lemons Raw Brass Band. Well, back mm -hmm. then, he, he, he co-led it. And that was the first band I ever made a record with. Anyway, he was in New York, and he had, a, he had some gigs. And then we did a tour uh, the, my first year back, of this David Byrne, Robert Wilson piece called The Knee Plays. And we went to Australia and Japan. And in the band, we added a guy who wasn't part of The Miserables because it was two saxophones. His name is Pablo Calagero. And he was a legendary baritone saxophone player who had been playing with Tito Puente. He, his, uh, he was part of the downtown music scene and all kinds of things. He's Upper West Side, Puerto Rican, actually half Puerto Rican, half Italian, just like me. And we got, we got really close. And he goes, hey, I got this gig. And we did this gig at this place called The Knitting Factory. Mm, and The wow. Knitting Factory was so new, didn't even have a liquor license yet. Mm. And the guys who owned it, these two college guys, were like, it was hot. They didn't have AC. And they walked around with their hairs and curlers. And one was wearing a kilt. And like, hey, man, what do you want? You want some tea? It was like, it's 90 fucking degrees <laughs> out. He's <laughs> like, I don't think I want any tea. But that's all they have. It's like tea and like spritzers, you know, like. And uh, so, but. The place, the Ninny Factory, wound up being this hotbed, like sure. where John yeah. Zorn, Bill Frizzell, Mark Rebo, Dave Douglas. I mean, I met all these people. Um, Stephen Bernstein, who you've had mm -hmm. here. I mean, I met these people who were like, then it was almost an extension of New England Conservatory because it was jazz musicians, guys who were playing contemporary, who like contemporary class music, punk rock guys. You know, like all this playing. So one night you'd have a punk rock group, uh, like the Beastie Boys. And then you'd have uh, Lou Reed, you know, like uh, the next night. Uh, and then you'd have uh, Henry Threadgill with, with, you know, with the sextet. I mean, like all this totally music that didn't even make sense. But it made sense to us because it was like, it's just sound, mm -hmm. cool sound, you know. And so it was a perfect place for a tuba kid who liked weird music. Mm -hmm. So they're like, dude, you played it too, but pretty good. Want to be in my band? <laughs> it had nothing, you know, it was like, if it was anywhere else, it was a jazz. I mean, listen, I grew up in New York, so if I went to the Vanguard with my tube, like, <laughs> step aside, get out of the way, you know. <laughs> I used to go to those places. I used to go to uh, Sweet Basil's all the time. I mean, I used to go mm -hmm. to Gill when I was in high school, you know, all the time at Sweet Basil's. And that's how I met Howard Johnson and Dave Taylor and... And John Clark, the great French trumpet player. So, um, so there was a lot of good stuff going on. But you know, in the first few years, but John Swallow used to say it takes five years to get it going. He goes, hmm. after five years, you should reassess whether you, this is going to be a good idea. Hmm. And by the fifth year, I was making a living as a musician. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And it, it, it blew into a bunch of other stuff. Because I played improvised music and I could play chord changes, you know, people can think of me as a jazz musician. I'm not. I mean, I wish. Um, I play with some of the greatest jazz musicians in the world. I know how to yeah, I solo and I can play. But being a jazz musician, I have too much respect to ever take on that mantle. That's like some that's some real high pre, sure, pre sure. stuff, right? Yeah. So I'm lucky that the jazz musicians like having me around. So that's a cool thing. But um, but because I could do these different things and I could play the tuba pretty well, I understand chamber. You know, I, I could think on my feet. That's how the studio stuff started. I used to do, mm. like you remember, like everyone used to have uh, rehearsal bands everywhere, mm -hmm. right? So I played in uh, Rich Shamaria's band, you know? Sure, Rich I did Rich's band, yeah, sure. And they had amazing charts. You had yeah. these really good tuba parts. Stuff, yeah. Really hard. Yeah. I was like, uh oh, right, this big boy pants stuff, you know? <laughs> but I was into it. I was practicing. I was like, man, can I take the book? He was like, no one's asked to take the books. Like, I need, I want to borrow the book. And he was like, oh, okay. And I'm <laughs> shitting, you know, tuba parts. I was like, I wanted, I didn't want to suck. When you have like these amazing players playing, I was like, all right. So, so Rich and Maria, I, that's how I met Bob Belden. Mm. You know, I met a bunch of guys doing these kinds of things. And so that's how I met then Pew and Taylor. And those guys started seeing me around. Then one day I get a call uh, to do a movie date. And there's a guy with funny, Brooklyn sounding voice, and not Brooklyn sound, a straight up Brooklyn guy. And he goes, Is this Mark Rojas? And I said, Yeah. He goes, um, I hear you play the tuba pretty good. I said, well, I don't know. I'm all right. Well, who's this? He goes, This is Emil Shalop. Uh, I got a date for you. 
Uh, I was like, okay, great. You know, like, I was, wow, date is good. It's good, right? Yeah. It's date. Yeah, it's a movie date. I just gotta tell you, if you're not any good, it's gonna be the last one you ever do. <laughs> Thanks. That's how he sounds, sounds like Emil. <laughs> so Emil, right? And so that's th that was that. And I never knew how it even happened. It had to happen through through those guys because you're not going to get through the gates without. Mm -hmm. them. They yeah. were they were that was they were locking it down. Yeah. And so it had to be. And I remembered years later thanking Dave Taylor. I was saying, hey, man, I gotta say, I really want to thank you for, you know, recommending me to. Uh, to Emil, you know, to do because then we got really busy. There was like a time we started doing a lot of movies, and he said, "I had nothing to do with that." I was like, "That's the biggest bunch of bull of all time." And I said, "I really, I, I'm serious. I, this is heartfelt. I want to say thank you. That I like it means a lot to me. It's like mm -hmm. feeding my family. It's like really great." He goes, "Kid, I don't know. You bark up the wrong tree. Cause it had nothing to do with me." <laughs> I'm like, "Why won't you take this thing? I'm trying to be like and, and, and like I'm arguing with him because I've always thought of him as Uncle Dave, right?" So I'm like. Uncle Dave. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to swear, but anyway. So so then later he comes up to me, he goes, kid, he goes, people think I recommend you, then that means I didn't recommend them. So shh, can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so old school. It's like, yeah. I can't tell anyone that I recommended you. Like, like, all right, so anyway, that's some maybe the audience doesn't want to know about that. But, <laughs> uh, no, good stuff. Um, all right. Yeah. I, sorry. Let's let's change the channel a little bit here and uh <laughs> let's talk about some of the the uh amazing jazz artists that you have worked with and i'm going to just throw out a couple names and you just give me some quick thoughts and okay. and more favorite memory or a favorite project or whatever just a handful of them uh let's start with charlie hayden oh man i, I went to cuba with charlie hayden uh it's the first time he had ever, ever been to cuba with the liberation music orchestra mm. and i was the only person who spoke spanish so i became his translator <laughs> Except I speak Spanglish because I'm from New York, you know, like, like, oh my God. So like trying to, he wanted to talk about the love and the politics. I was like, oh man, I'm so over my head. <laughs> so, uh, but that was deep. Joe Lovano was in that band, Jerry Allen, uh, Danny Gottlieb was playing drums. Oh, wow. Bizarre wow. One. Uh, uh, Ray Anderson, uh, Tom Harold. It was like, it wasn't like, the, it was like really bizarre because we didn't, I didn't realize we weren't getting paid. We were getting paid in like Cuban money, which is like worthless. So we couldn't even use it, but people just went to do it. Yeah. Uh, so wow. anyway, so that was a really good, and I wound up doing like a, a few more gigs. Very I was so cool. I always, you know, one guy we didn't talk about is is um is Bob Stewart, the mm. great Bob mm -hmm. Stewart. It's incredible, and the reason why I did many of these gigs is because Bob out of the blue called me. Mm. I get a phone, uh, I listen to my answer machine, and it says, "Hey, this Mark, Ro this is uh, Bob Stewart. Keep hearing about this poor Rican cat that plays the tuba. <laughs> Give me a call. I got a date tomorrow. You want me? You want to come by?" And I was like. What? And I call him. He's like, yeah, man, I keep hearing about you. Hey, I'm doing this thing tomorrow with Ray Anderson. If, you want, if you're not doing anything, come on by. And so I did. I came by, and I'm watching him rehearse for a record day. He goes, come to the record day tomorrow, and I hang out. Then he came to see me play at the Knitting Factory. And then he started calling me. Mm. And he called me for a bunch of stuff. And that's how I think I got on the Charlie wow. Hayden thing. And, and a lot of other stuff. I mean, yeah. like, if it weren't for him, half of my career wouldn't exist, mm. honestly. So anyway, so that's so Charlie amazing. Hayden. That's that's yeah. how it happens. We were talking about it before we started with uh, with Kent Lester Bowie. Oof, Lester, the greatest leader I've ever played under, like the wow. most empowering person. High praise. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, very, very empowering. So again, I was subbing for Bob Stewart, and Bob, I don't know if you've heard his playing, but man, he puts a real imprint on a band, mm. and it's real specific and it's strong. And so like, so I was a strong player, but I was like, it was like all over the place, all kind of music. So I was. Learning the music, and luckily there were books to the music, and okay, as long as it's a book, but there were a bunch of charts that didn't have anything. So one of the tunes is a tune, tune called Crazy, uh, the Patsy Cline. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so I transcribe it. I'm like, man, this is great, you know, and I bring it to the rehearsal, and Bob was actually at the rehearsal, and he's like, what's that? I said, that's crazy. He goes, no, that's not the chart for crazy. It's just a chord chart. I was like, no, no, this is the chart. This is This is the thing. He said... No, it's not. It, it's just a chord chart. I said, no, no, no. I know, I know the original part must be a chord chart, but this is what you play. He's like, no, it's not. Because there were notes all over the place. Like, like skipping in tens. Like, uh -huh. And he's looking at this, and he's like, in disbelief, he goes, Marks, man, I can't play this shit. <laughs> I was like, no, no, I'm not si You played it. I wrote every note you played. Yeah. So how it gets back to less. So then I, we do a week at, at, at Sweet Basil's, actually. And so when he calls that tune... 
I'm ready. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna play all this Bob stuff, and I play it. And then we get off the stage, and you know, he, he always wore a, a belt to hold his like guts in because he always had hernias and stuff because he played so hard. So he's on strap in like this, like you know, movers. Ah, and he's like, yo, yo, Rojas, what was that you were playing on Crazy? I said, I'm like, cool, right? I was, I, I, it's, it's it's that Bob stuff. It's incredible. He goes, man, don't 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 play that. Please don't play that. It's like, why not? He goes, I want to know what you played like. He's like, wow. man, that, that, that doesn't sound like the way you play, man. And I was like, yeah, but I don't know what I'm doing. He goes, well, you'll figure it out. Wow, I mean, so cool. right from the beginning, yeah. I was the first time I played in his band. I know I killed the part. I know it was hitting yeah. it. But he was like, no, don't play like that. Mm -hmm. That's not how you play. I want to wow. know how you play. So it was very interesting. I think he, would, he could have easily been a Fortune 500 like a CEO because he was the really smart. You know, big, I, uh, clearly a big picture guy, right? And, and huge nurturing. picture guy. Like you know, when he joined the, the AACM, it, it, it was like it's almost like you know it was like before Lester and after. Mm -hmm. They started doing all these amazing gigs. You know, the Art Ensemble became this. It was his idea to change the name to the Art Ensemble of Chicago, as opposed to like calling it you know a person's name's mm -hmm. quintet. And he had vision. He mm. was just a really visionary cat. Very cool. Uh, well, another trumpet player, and I know uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing about this, but your association with Dave Douglas. Oof, like I, I met him when I was, you know, we were, ex I think, exactly the same age. I met him at the Knitting Factory, and uh, actually the first time he asked me to play with him, this is the one thing about being a guy who plays a lot of music, is it you start getting calls for stuff. And I was like, yeah, I could do, I'll do your night. And then, you know, like four nights before, I got a call like to, like to do like a run of gigs at the Met. I'm like, hey, Dave, I can't do your gig. He's like, what do you mean you can't do my gig? It's like, it's like, well, I got to I know, but you say you can do my gig. I was like, I know, but it's the Met, and it pays like 10 times what your gig is. like, yeah, but it's my gig. <laughs> but after that, he forgave me, uh -huh. and I wound up playing in a bunch of groups. He did this beautiful group he had called Nomad with cello, tuba, uh, one of the was bass clarinet, clarinet, trumpet, and drums. And we recorded a record, toured a bunch, and then um, I've also been part of his festival, New Trumpet, and then he had a band called Brass Ecstasy, mm -hmm, which was a, a, like a tribute band originally to Lester, and then it, it went on to Holo Thing. But he's an incredible musician, and like um, he's really a guy who plays the trumpet like a saxophone player. And I remember, and this is how I knew I wasn't a jazz musician, because we'd be playing a song, I'm like, yeah, I'm killing it. And then he'd be quoting you know, something and looking at me like, you know, and then he's going, and he's like looking at me like, going, and then at the end of the day, he's like, what, what happened? I was like, why? Wow. So he goes, I was playing Seven Steps to Heaven. Why don't you go with me? I was like, because I don't know. And he goes, you don't know that? I was like, no, I don't know that. He was like, dude, you got to know that. And like, It's like he was literally like, like just assumed I would get that because he's a stone cold jazz. Sure. And, yeah. and when he plays with, you know, he's like, he does that. James Jennings is going to hit that like in two seconds, like two notes. He's in. So I was like, I don't know. I'm playing my part pretty good. So I learned a lot with being, a, I'm telling you, I've been around these guys who were very forgiving. Um, but incredible. Like, so Dave Doug is probably the hardest working person I know. Like, like he's the guy who, like, from the time he gets an idea to the time it comes to fruition is the shortest point. Mm. Like, the fastest. Wow. When he told me he was going to start this band, Brass Ecstasy, when we were coming back from a different tour. And, and actually, he didn't say what the name was. He said, I'm going to do it because he was asking me about Lester. He goes, what was Lester like? I was like, what do you mean? You know Lester. He goes, no, I never met him. I was like, oh, that's incredible. Mm. So we were talking. He goes, okay, I think I'm going to start this band, right? And, and I was like, oh, cool. And then he tells me what he's going to call it. I'm like, are you sure about that? Brass Ecstasy? It sounds like Brass Ecstasy. Fast friends, he goes, I know, that's the point. I'm like, <laughs> okay, okay. You know, but he starts with three guys who were in Brass Fantasy. So uh -huh. we were like, I don't know, it's kind of goofy. But from the time he did it, he got a gig, like two, like festival g gigs, like a month later. Yeah. And, and then we did a record before that. Like, he was just so fast. He did it, and like a week later, he wanted to start rehearsing. He had a, written a book of music, and it was organized, and each guy, I mean, really, he's just a guy who's really, and he does that with every group, you know, he's got like 10 groups at, at one time, any yeah. given time. And what he's built with Greenleaf, and, uh, you know, it's he's quite impressive. He's a very inspiring yeah. guy. Oh, yeah, no, like, no doubt. Like, super inspiring. Yeah, very cool. One more name for you, Gil Evans. Oh, so Gil, uh, I only got to play with the band like about like four or five times, but he was important because I used to go see them when I was in high school. And when I didn't have any money, I would just go listen on the outside, right? Mm. I'd just go hang out. And there was a doorman there who said, 
you know, it was like, kid, kid, get out of the way. You got, you know, people coming in, you know. And one day I showed up like in a denim jacket. It was like late October. It was freezing. I was like, Phew. and he's like, kid, you are killing me, man. Like, it's so cold. He goes, like, come inside, sit in the corner. If I got a paying customer, I'm throwing you out, you know. So I said, okay. So I just hung out. And every time I'd go on a Monday night, he's like, all right, go to your spot. <laughs> so I'd go, and I finally got the nerve. Like, I'd watch them, and, you know, it was like, all these guys, Dave Taylor. It was like like what I wanted. To, I wanted. To, I always told me I wanted to be the Dave Taylor of the tuba. Uh -huh. You know, a guy who played a lot of music. John Zorn said to me, yeah, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, but anyway, so I would see those guys, and, and it was really, really inspiring. But then I got to play, Tom Malone called me to sub for him, mm. and then Howard told me to call. And uh, But the funny thing is that, so he, when I graduated, he was given an honorary degree. Mm. And he was sitting next to George Russell, right? And when I got my degree, you know, George is, you know, pulling us. He's like, check this out. So then after it, he goes, hey, hey, Marcus, come over here. I want you to meet someone. He's like, I want you to meet Gil Evans, He's a lover of the tuba. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, so great. He goes, oh, I hear you play pretty good. I was like, yeah, that's just, I can't believe it. Gil Evans, you know. He said, when you come to New York, he goes, oh, I, yeah, I've got, I have the funniest tuba players now. I have, you know, I go, uh, Bob Stewart, uh, no, it was what he said about Howard. He goes, Howard plays uh, bebop on the tuba and funk on the saxophone, you know. <laughs> He said, well, when you come to New York, give me a call, you know, like, and I was like, I didn't think he, he meant it, you know, and then I did, you know, after, after I got called a sub, I wound up talking to him, and he goes, I remember, I, I remember you, you're welcome here anytime, and so, wow. it was, but, you know, that, that version of the Guild Band is totally different than, like, you know, the, you know, like the stuff in the 50s, because it oh, was, of course. it was yeah. like a rock band at that point, right. rock band with horns, and, and so it would be like this collab crazy, I remember what, like, like, like uh, Lou Saul of having a spit fight, a spitball fight with Taylor. I mean, it was like during the gig, I was like, respect the music. I was freaking out. Like, what are you guys doing? We're going to get in trouble, you know? And they were going crazy and hiring Bullock, like taking super long, crazy, amazing solos. And then all of a sudden, something would happen when it hit a gill spot, you know, like one of the arrangements would hit in. And everyone in the band was just like, uh oh. <laughs> And you could just feel like, uh oh, like now, like once we actually hit the arrangements, but sometimes we wouldn't, like, you know, because it became so jammy that there were plenty of times when it mm. didn't get to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was incredible. Yeah. It really, um, really, it's really beautiful person. It's the most gentle guy I ever met, the, the least leader person I ever met. He huh. was just, he'd raise his hand and give a cue, and people wouldn't even see it and just put his hand back down. <laughs> wow. And then, okay. <laughs> and then we cue and then we move on. Wow. Very interesting. Well, changing gears a little bit again, it seems like a natural progression that you would start doing your own solo projects and, and developing this whole repertoire for yourself and, and, and the various ensembles that you worked with uh, as a solo artist. Um, maybe, uh, maybe talk a little bit about Spanish Fly, and I know your longtime association with Steve Bernstein. Yeah. And, and, uh, um, but it's just in general, like how... It, it, you can now now with all the history that we just got you can see how it naturally progressed into you turning this thing into a solo instrument right. but how, what are your uh, thoughts on that so it's funny because it, it never felt like a progression i mean the school did but but it was all just happening all at once it kind of felt like mm. I mean, i'd literally come from the ballet and go to the knitting factory in a mm. tuxedo you know and guys <laughs> like where are you coming from you know or come from a weird weird weirdo music gig and then go to you know you know something else um but so bernstein and i met uh, with, with this guy dave tronzo and and there was something about when we have a conversation everyone else when we leave the rehearsals they were, they were at the music building on 30 mm -hmm. uh, 7th street right the big rock studio so at the end of rehearsal everyone else went downtown the three of us were the only guys that lived north of there so we'd be walking we just have this conversation it'd be like kind of a banter it's like and bernstein's like man this feels like a band you know <laughs> and bernstein's just like you know like yeah man we got us a band it's like about? we haven't even played anything and we go to his house and he makes chili for us or some soup you know and he he's hey i got these little ideas man and it's like little thing little groove little thing and Dave Charles is a genius of the guitar, man. He's a slide guitar wizard mm -hmm. and really incredible. And Bernstein, like, just this guy who's always keeping track. I remember, he, he, he taped the very first time we ever played together. So, yeah, I'm just going to tape this, you know, on a cassette recorder. Mm -hmm. Tapes it. And it was like, we were just playing free and going places. And then we played like a little, we went to like a, 
Hendrix tune and start playing that, you know, and then we played like a folk song, you know, and so Duke Ellington tune, Black and Tan Fantasy, <laughs> all like one after the other, just falling into it. And we listened back to it, like we, when we ate our soup, and we're like, wow, that sounds cool. And for me, it was like, chamber music. <laughs> But he was like, I don't know if you call it that. He was like, sounds like the art ensemble. And and so we and but and Toronto was like, man, it's the hippest blues band I have been a part of, you know. <laughs> and so we all were thinking it, thinking it sounded like a different thing, but it had a voice. Um, but so that was a collective, and that that was the thing that wound up. You know, we played records for. Uh, for they might be giants had a record of the month club, but they hired us to do something. We used to open for those guys mm. because Tronzo was such a shredder. I mean, he could really shred. Mm -hmm. Besides being a guy who had sounds, he wasn't just a weird band. So we we could play at like jazz festivals, right? Like we I remember playing with jazz festival in uh, uh, the Heineken Jazz Festival, and Brecker comes out those man, it's the slickest band ever. Heard. This is amazing, you know. And he knew Tronzo, right? But then we'd also play at like at the Whitney Museum for art installation. Mm. And we would do like, okay, let's do sound paintings. You know, and we would do these abstract things and it was like kind of abstract, but kind of, you know, beautiful. At least people said it was beautiful. But then because we had Tronzo, we'd also open up the bands at CBGB's. Mm. So like a band called Shudder to Think, They Might Be Giants. There were a bunch of groups around that were like, hey man, would you guys open for us? And then for those gigs, we'd add drums. We'd get, bring in Ben Prowski. Mm. And then it'd become like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the tuba coming through like giant amps, you know. So cool. Yeah. So the same band that had just been going, it was like, boom, doom, boom, 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 or whatever, like, boop, 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 you know. It was like a trad band. So anyway, that's how that group started. But uh, it led to a lot of other kind of groups like that. People started seeing the tuba in a kind of a different way. Like, wow, the tuba can do these things. You know, it's the funny thing about me starting groups. I just did a, um, I did a, a master class at ASU. Jim Self invited me to, uh, to talk. And at the end, someone said, so I have a question. How, how did you start all these groups, mm, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how did, how, how did you... Like when you start a group, how did you do that? And what I had to be totally honest with them about is that I didn't start any, all these groups that I play in were always led by someone else. Ah, oh, interesting. So the, what I'm really good at is convincing people to use me in their band. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, like, like it's, it, it's a weird thing. I mean, because here's the thing, as you know, as you have this empire here of <laughs> brass not sure nation I, I, I'm not trying to go quite that far but thank no, you no no but the <laughs> amount of effort it takes to do this and the, and in an, an investment in all this which is just a herculean i think is amazing that you do this right my whole aesthetic has always been i need to get paid mm -hmm. like i'm a professional musician not because I'm being a jerky, but just because I grew up as a poor person. Mm -hmm. So the idea of like doing something and not getting paid for it, like making a tuba so like people say, Marcus, how come you don't have a solo tuba record? It's like, because no one's paying me to do it. <laughs> and, right? And so so like, but but you know, there's all these guys in like solo records. I'm like, God bless you, that's incredible. Like, but if I'm not making money, and some people are like, well, how much money are you actually making? It's like for me it doesn't matter. As long as I'm making a little bit, like, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes we don't only make, you know, a hundred dollars or whatever. As long as I'm not losing money. Yeah. So the weird thing is I've joined, I, I've helped, because I've met all these different people from different places, these groups have started. You know, I have a group called Musette Explosion, which is a guitar, accordion, tuba group. But they were a group with a bass player before, and then I played with them and they got rid of the bass player. And mm. So now mm -hmm. it's a tuba, you know. Mm -hmm. And now we made a record. It was the first time we made a record, you know. But I've been in lots of groups like that. You know, mm -hmm. um, I used to have a group with my ex-wife. It was a tuba flute marimba trio. That mm -hmm. was the only group where we probably did the most investment because basically because she ran it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but we commissioned a bunch of music. Um, so, you know, the idea of commissioning, I don't know how it works, but the idea of putting too much, too many of my own chips into something, mm -hmm. like I'm not a gambler. Like I never gamble. I, right. I'm the worst person to hang out at like uh, Las Vegas. I'm like, wow, sounds cool. I think I'm going to get a seltzer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not into it, you know. <laughs> It comes from a weird. I'm not depression era kid, but it's that kind of thing. It's like oh, I ain't spending my money. Like, 
Like, like the famous line from the producers, never put your own money in the show. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's perfect. Exactly. So it's not that I don't believe in the project. But the truth is when I do them, they become mine and I'm very vested in them. It's not like, you know, sometimes jobbers get a bad name. Like, oh, you're just a jobber, right? And probably people have tried to put that label on me. It's like, you can call me whatever I want you want. But when I'm on your gig, I'm there like 1,000%. And I, I'll bleed for you. I've bled for guys literally bleeding at the cops, you know. I've, you know, I've lost money on gigs, you know. I mean, I've done gigs, you know, like not done the Met. Like I lost many gigs, accounts, because I decided to do pr creative projects. Mm -hmm. That's my way of investing. But to start something from scratch, mm -hmm. well, it's a little scary for yeah. me. <laughs> now, it's the thing that I want to do. But again, it's that step of like how much of my own money do I want to put into this? Yeah. Well, fair enough. And, and, you know, I think the fact that you bring so much creativity and spontaneity and energy to the projects that you play in, like you say, that's what, that's what your investment is. So, so I think to call you a jobber or whatever <laughs> is, is completely inaccurate if you ask me. But let's, you know, I know that you're very passionate about your teachers and how much they meant to you. Um, and you've become that kind of passionate uh, teacher yourself. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, now you're up at Berkeley College of Music. Uh, that seems to be expanding for you this year, you were mentioning earlier, and yeah. uh, um, Boston Conservatory. Just tell us a little bit about where you're at as a, as a teacher these days. Uh, so I love teaching, and I do have this thing about giving back. I mean, I, I can never give back all the good teacher juju I've been mm -hmm. given. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, mm -hmm. my life would not exist if it weren't for other people looking out for me. I feel like I've had many angels. Some just like one angel. I've had like <laughs> dozens of angels. I'm a seriously like type of person uh -huh. in that sense, right? So I, I'm always looking out for anyone who's like has any interest in playing, right? So I always like to teach. Um, and I've taught at a lot of places, but I've always felt guilty about teaching in certain places because the idea of the prospect of someone becoming a tuba major always seems like a bad idea to me. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that people shouldn't play the tuba. And I, I don't want this to get misconstrued, but the idea that you would go and not have a real plan, you know, because oftentimes people, I, first of all, I think everyone should take a year off of school before going to college mm -hmm. and get a job, you know, mm -hmm. and see what it's like. And then if we, and when you're done, if you still want to go play music, well, then you're, you're probably pretty into it. But some people just go, okay, the next step is, and we're not talking about your kids or my kids who are, you know, who come from music families who are, you know, it's not their fault that they're musicians. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. Like, you know, like sure. sometimes like uh, and, uh, and one of these I asked him, I said, well, why are you doing like, so why are you here? It's like, uh, I don't know, because I, I like music. I was like, well, now why don't you get a radio and, you know, or a CD player, <laughs> or, you know, fill up an iPad, you know, and just, you know, it's like, but why do you want to play the tuba? It's yeah. Like, and they go, oh, I don't know. I was like, not a good answer. <laughs> And I'll go that, like, for the next three, four weeks. All right, so you figure out why you want to play the tuba. Uh, and it's like, when if, if you vacillate that much, it's like, no, 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 you really have to think about this. This is what you're going to, like, you're spending a lot of money to do this. All right, so the reason why I'm being this whole thing about this is because it, it used to make me weird, weird out. Now, teaching at Berkeley, I'm kind of digging it because... All the kids have all this other stuff that you can take at the school. There's the technology stuff there, the arranging, the writing, the film scoring. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So all the almost all my students, except for one, are not even tuba majors. I'm I, like they play the tuba, but I'm like, no, 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 go do that to do this technology. I think I was telling you before. One of them is like creates like these amazing beats. You know, as he calls them beats, but there's be these tracks that are like professional. Sound amazing. He's got friends and he sends stuff to people to rap over, someone to sing. And I'm just like, this sounds like it's off the radio. So when he comes for lessons, I'm like, now here's the trick. Since I'm your tuba teacher, I want as much of this music to be replaced with the tuba. Can mm -hmm. you figure that mm -hmm. out? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want him sitting around playing Arbins, man. Like, it's not what he's going to do. So it's a place that. And, and by the way, when he came back, I was blown away. I was like, dude, you're going to produce my record because <laughs> it sounded so hip. So so the, the, I do think as long as you, you're really clear that you know what, you, what you're what you getting into, because it's not for the faint of heart. You know that. Mm -hmm. you know? By the way, I think there will, will always be people playing music on planet Earth. But that being said, going to college for music, and that's a giant investment. So, um, but I really do like teaching there. And then Boston Conservatory, they're, they're doing all kinds of cool stuff there, you know. 
they're, 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 the, the new music and the, and the cherry music there is really, really fantastic. And, uh, and we're talking about bringing people up there to inspire them, you know, people like C.J. Camareri, you know, mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. Westerlies, like mm -hmm. all these really interesting people who don't necessarily play cl uh, contemporary music, but they're straight up classical musicians, you know, but are figuring out what else you can do with a classical music education, mm -hmm. you know, with that kind of skill set, you know. And I think that's the main thing is figuring out what skill set you have and do you have a skill set that, that is employable? Because in the end, it's a job. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think that it's a job... Then, then, then you're fooling yourself because it is a job. And for all the fun gigs we talked about, you know how many gigs we've done that are just like, <laughs> you just, okay, I'm here. You put, you put on your lunch pail, you bring your lunch pail, put your hat on, okay. <laughs> and <laughs> off to work we go. <laughs> a couple of them come to mind. Right yeah, a couple. That, right? <laughs> it just happens, you know, and that's fine. It's okay. It's part of the thing, yeah. you know. And um, that's part, you know, it's part of life. It's, it's like, you know, every day is not uh, exactly as you uh, see in your perfect utopia world, you know. Absolutely. But, uh, and that's something that sometimes kids don't get. They think like, oh, I'm a musician. I'm just going to be like having fun. I was like, no, 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 no. First of all, you have to practice your butt off. <laughs> yeah. And you have to keep your chops up forever. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like, because the minute you stop, you just kind of don't sound good anymore. So there's that, and then there's like, you know, the business is always changing. Can you adapt to what the business is changing into? As you, hey, we're like living examples. How much, how much recording did we do like 25 years ago? Yeah. How much do we do now? It's like a lot different. Yeah. yeah. You know, but people who are nimble figure out, okay, so now I need to figure out how to do this. And, you know, you know Broadway shows have, are never sounded better. You have some of the greatest musicians playing Broadway shows. I remember, so New York used to be really different. You had, in New York City in the old days, you had classical music guys. They only mm -hmm. did, there were so many freelance classical gigs, they just did classical music gigs. They were the Broadway guys. And they were, the guys only did that. And then there were guys who did um, uh, just every kind of thing. There were guys who did club dates. Mm. They, there wasn't always a mixing so much like there is now. Sure. Now, everyone does everything and it's always the highest level guys. I think that was, you know, uh, a byproduct of our time. You know, I, I remember mentioning uh, Jim Pugh, for for example. You know, uh, he was the first guy that I remember seeing. Oh, wow, he's doing a show, and he was purely that he was the top call studio trombone player. So it, that to me signaled a big shift in the fact that, you know, some people were doing that, other people were t taking on teaching gigs, and you know, back in the day, as we know, you know, Irby Green's era. Irby, you know, wouldn't have answered the phone for somebody calling for a Broadway show. He was strictly a top call studio guy. And Irby told me himself how he would take the whole summer off. Yeah. Just three months. And then he'd start, oh, I'll, go, I'll start filling up my calendar for September. Well, you know, he is Irby Green, the greatest of all time, arguably. <laughs> <laughs> but still, it shows you the, 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 the climate and the, work, uh, the workplace at that time is very, very, very different now. Totally different. I mean, I always hear about guys who, you know, there were guys who could play. There were gigs in Chinese restaurants. Every Chinese restaurant had like a trio, you know. There was the cat skills, you know. Right. There, were like, there was music everywhere. It was like having music, live music was such a, like, a normal thing. And it wasn't like they didn't have a radio. It was like, well, having a radio is kind of cheesy. I'd rather well, class up the joint. Let's get a little trio <laughs> in the corner. You know, this just these kinds of things change. I think, weirdly enough, they're coming back in a different way. I just don't know about like how, how people, you know, obviously people, a lot of gigs aren't union gigs, and it's, it's changing. And it's one of the things I really would love to try to help to teach the younger generations is the value of what they do. So not to let other people set the value, but to say, like, no, this is what this costs. Like, if you want this, this is what, and it's not that much money. You buy Starbucks, yeah. you know, every day, right. twice a day. It's like over, it's like $12 a day, and you it's too much for you to pay $30 to come see me play? <laughs> right. Seriously? Yeah. That's like, you know, it's, like your, your Starbucks bowl for like, you know, three it's, days. Like, it's a, super, being a jerk. It's super good point. And, and I love that you say, you know, I'm not, to, I, I'm getting paid. And I think that's, a, you know. Our, our professional base. 50 bucks, you got to give me something. <laughs> yeah. You know, or else, no. Yeah. You know, whatever, you know. You know, I was going to ask you the state, where you see the state of the music industry in New York going forward, but I think you've actually just answered that in a way that it's like your whole career has basically been structured in the way that I think you have to go going forward now, which is be nimble, be prepared, play your butt off, and be ready to be open about everything you could possibly put yourself in and you've and you've done that i mean you put yourself in these ensembles and i love the fact that you you talk about how oh it used to be a bass player and now they add the tuba because the tuba is such a cool sound it's a very unique sound 
and a lot of people are going to are, are attracted to it you know so the fact that you're talking about your your outstanding student at, at berkeley the fact that he can do all these tracks and th what great advice like figure out a way to add the tuba to it don't make the tuba the centerpiece but no. just add the tuba yeah you know? i mean I, listen I, nothing against tuba jazz i'm just not into it i don't want to hear the tuba play a solo on every tune like if you have a really good clarinet player, let him do all the soloing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, that's another thing. The idea of, like, playing bass lines, you know, like, a lot of guys don't learn to do that. It's like, it's not that hard a thing to do. You have to learn roots and fifths and some passing tones, you know, like, just to get started. You know, the, the fact that everyone just doesn't do that automatically kind of shocks me a little bit. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if, if you already said it, that the more things you do, first of all, you also you'll have a way more fun. If mm -hmm. I only, this is the truth. If I only played tuba gigs, I might have killed myself a long time ago. <laughs> 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 no, but I mean, I, I, I probably wouldn't be interested in playing, you know, because I just, you know, it's just me. I, I like to, you know, I have a certain kind of personality. I like to be in the mix, you know, and be part of the thing. And I think that everyone does. I think it's one of, I'm going to say something trying to piss off some people, but I think that's one of the things that happens with orchestra guys. You know, certain orchestra guys, they're some of the most overqualified people that play their gigs. You know, they're so good. To get one of those gigs, you have to be so good. Sure. But then once you get the gig, then you have to do the gig. <laughs> and the gig is the gig. And sure, but, and that's also something that may, I mean, I'm not saying when you play it's a hard piece or something you know, that take calls for you especially, but I've seen guys, some of the most unhappy people I've ever seen were people who have jobs in mm -hmm. orchestras. It's mm -hmm. like, man, what do you have to gripe about? Like, you have a job, you're yeah. cool. Yeah. But they're not satisfied because something in them is not being massaged or something or it's not being loved or not being nurtured, you know? Mm -hmm. So the thing about doing a lot of stuff isn't just about being a, weirdo like me or a jazz guy is just good for you mm -hmm. you know it's like having a balanced diet <laughs> you know absolutely and i think you know i always say it in my in my uh, master classes and clinics like make yourself uncomfortable and and you've done that your whole career i'm sure there's many times when you're standing up there playing with gil evans for the first time or dave douglas or whoever it might be you're uncomfortable but when you're in, in that uncomfortable zone if you're open that's when you're going to get the biggest amount of benefit for sure and, and the biggest amount of growth. And, you know, you've, you've done that throughout your career. Yeah, I mean, it's true about the growth thing. I mean, I, 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 I think I'm a, addicted to being a scared because <laughs> I put myself in that position all the time. Like, that's how I know I'm getting older because I'm not as a scared every time I show up to a game. Like, okay, I'm not going to be I'm not found out. They're going to not, you know, like a... You're like, okay, they, they they call me back. Yay! You know? And I've been doing it for so long. Like, you know, like now I just take it for granted that the tuba plays this or that it does that or does these different things. But it's not just about the tuba. It's like every instrument has that ability to, to like yeah. morph itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, these instruments could easily go the way of like the Orphoclide or, you know, like... <laughs> You know, you know. Yeah, absolutely. The, you know, yeah. like these are like 19th century instruments. If we don't figure out how to be part of contemporary music and contemporary culture, then they're just going to go away. You know. And the truth is, you're right. People are really loving brass bands are everywhere in New York City. It's like New Orleans in New York City now. Mm -hmm. There's like brass bands everywhere hitting the streets. A lot of them are my students. Some aren't my students. And here's the thing that kills me. And I got to tell you, tuba players, you got to get hip. <laughs> There are guys who play trombone who are killing on those gigs because they know how to play music, mm. right? So guys are like, I'm going to go buy myself a sousaphone, man, because the tube is cool. And, 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 you know, I can play it outside without an amp. So I've, I've had students, and I'm not going to, you know, sorry if you, you see yourself in this comment, but I've had <laughs> students who are losing gigs to, like, trombone players or bass players who pick up a tuba. Yeah. Because they think it's about like, oh, man, but I play the tuba better. I was like, obviously not. <laughs> because this guy has your gig. So, yeah, you play the tuba better. But this guy knows a little bit more about how music goes. And so when a song happens, he makes the song feel better. And while you're playing all this amazing stuff on the tuba, which, man, you sound good when you play that stuff. I don't think anyone's playing, paying you to play Paganini Caprice on the tuba. Mm -hmm. Or to play box and, and I love playing that stuff. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to be anti-good or anti-virtuoso. I'm just saying, like, get your priorities straight. Get your, you know, 
You know, and I, I don't mean, I feel like maybe I'm calling people out, but I'm not trying to. What I'm trying to do is like, come on, wake up. Yeah. <laughs> because there's actually lots of gigs out there. There are lots of gigs. You know that saying, uh, necessity is the mother of invention? Sure. You know, that's the thing, you know, or if you create it, they'll come, you know. That's basically, I'm just like, okay, I do this crazy thing with the tuba. Who wants some? Who wants some? <laughs> you know? All right, I'll tell you a quick story. I, I know we're going probably long, but when I was a kid, I'm talking when I was at Music and Art. I used to go hang out in Grand Village. So Music and Art was on 135th Street. It's a long way to get to that. So I would mm -hmm. walk sometimes or go to 59th Street and then walk to 59th Street because I would dream about, man, if I could only live in Manhattan, man, live in one of the <laughs> Upper West Side apartments. And I did, and then I got divorced. You know? <laughs> but anyway, so, but I was like, man, if I could only do this. And I just literally walking down with, you know, um, but I used to always notice that all the hip guys in the village, right, would like walk around with their saxophone cases or their trombone cases, you know. Always from that, what was that leather shop that was on? Uh, Joe's Leather? Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like that leather shop where everyone got custom made cases, right? Yeah, yeah. And guitar players had their, you know, new guitars and bass players and guys with really fancy drum bags, yeah. you know. <laughs> I used to start carrying my tuba around. I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm a cat. I want to be a cat like these guys, right? I used to carry my tuba. Yeah, man. You know, like, hey, where you coming? I'm coming from a thing. It's called high school, but yeah, man. <laughs> I used to walk around my tuba all the time. Literally, the guy's like, man, you must be busy. Because I just carried my tuba. Because like, well, I want people to know I play the tuba. Oh, that's great. It's, you know, this I think, like visualization. Like, basically, sure. I was like kind of creating this thing. I was like, I'm a guy. I'm a cat, just like all these other cats. I, every time Gil Evans band empty out, it's all these guys with cases coming out. It's like, I don't want to be one of the guys coming out of a club with a case. <laughs> Man, I seriously the, the, the power of visualization. There's no question it's about so it. It's so deep. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. have to be the thing you want to do. Not yeah. just you know, I'm gonna practice and now I'm great. Call me. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. No, it's 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 like it's your whole everything has to get into it. Well, my last question yeah. of this interview was what you just answered, which is the the a uh, single piece of advice for young people, and uh, you just said it. I can't, couldn't put it any better than that. That was a uh, Awesome. Marcus, it's been such a pleasure, man. Your energy is, is great. And it's talk about a great way to uh, kick off a pandemic and yeah, get right? rid of it and move on. Uh, we're, yes! we're excited to be uh, back up and running here with our Bone to Pick series. And it couldn't be any better having you finally uh, Thank you on here. Thank you so much. And uh, so, so many great stories. And uh, it feels like uh, you, you bridge so much of old, old, old school New York to what's going on now. And it's just, we're all very fortunate to have. Uh, you get an opportunity to hear about your life and, and your career. And uh, it's, you know, we can't wait to see what the next chapter of Marcus Rojas is going to be. It's Me gonna, too. <laughs> it's going to be something great. So, Marcus, thank you so oh, much. Thank you so much for having and me. This is really amazing. Everybody keep such an beautiful eye. work here. Yeah, oh, thank really you, Marcus. Amazing. Keep an eye out. We're, Marcus has just done a, a really cool uh, Hip on You video. So that'll be coming out uh, after the interview. And uh, keep an eye out for this gentleman. It's, uh, it's always going to be something uh, amazing that he's working on. So thank you all for joining us on Bone to Pick, and we will see you all next time.